Hello and welcome to Food Safety Fridays. My name is Simon Timpley from the International Food Safety and Quality Network and our special guest and good friend Maria Sandoval from Trace Analytics. Good morning, Maria. Hi, good morning. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Yes, I've got two legs, two arms and uh, everything's in good hey. working order. <laughs> um, uh, just tell the audience where you join us from today, Maria. So um, we're out here in Austin, Texas, um, where, you know, we should be in winter, but it's currently 67, almost 70 degrees Fahrenheit. It's rainy and muggy, so it's mm. practically a microbial incubator outside. Yeah, sounds like it. And we dream of temperatures like that in, in Manchester. That 67 is probably like the hottest summer day we've ever had. We've got the rain, but just not the temperature, but yeah. um, just very bland and boring. Anyway, <laughs> uh, welcome, everybody. Type in the sidebar. Let us know where you're joining us from today. It's always good to see, you know, Ohio, Canada, Wisconsin, Qatar, Vietnam. Superb. Okay, uh, I'm going to play the video ads now because uh, Food Safety Fridays is, is kindly sponsored. Trace Analytics are one of the kind sponsors. So I'm going to play the video ads and we'll be back for Maria's presentation directly after. Okay. The world of food has changed a lot in the last hundred years. But one thing that doesn't change? Ensuring the quality and safe handling of food. No matter what changes are yet to come, we're proud to always be on our client's side, shaping the future of food today and tomorrow. AIB International, ever onward. Okay, uh, thanks to the Food Safety Friday sponsors. How's the presentation? Uh, are you there, Maria? Hope. <laughs> are you still there, Maria? Can you turn your mic on, please? Perfect. There. Okay, uh, I'll be back for the Q&A afterwards. Um, if you can hold your questions till the end, that will be great. And we'll be having the questions at the end. But for now, I'll hand you over to Maria. Great. Thank you so much. All right. So, hi, good morning. Um, like Simon mentioned, we're going to be discussing air today, specifically testing for non-viable and viable particle contaminants in ambient air. So this is gonna be a little bit of a deviation from my title, 
But something I think is important to mention, especially in the days of COVID-19, when microbes are now all a buzzword. So uh, let's go ahead and get started. So I think you'll appreciate this talk a little bit better if you think of yourself as a vector that carries contaminants everywhere you go. So let's read this sentence. <clears throat> a person's mere presence in a room can add 37 million bacteria to the air every hour. Mater so this is um, material largely left behind by previous occupants. So think about, um, think about when a person who has perfume on walks past you, right? You can smell it after they leave. And those are, those are particles that are being carried to your nose. And just like that, um, they get stirred up from the floor as well. Let's say you drag your feet when you walk or there's dust or sand on the floor. So we live in this um, microbial soup and a big ingredient is our own microorganisms that are attached to our body. It's also known as microflora. Um, mostly people are just resuspending other people's microbes, which sounds disgusting, but you need to be thinking about that when you're thinking about monitoring the quality of your ambient air. Uh, but it does turn out um, through a lot of research that the floor dust is the major source of bacteria that we breathe. Um, but here's the thing, that's not all that there's there. That, that's just bacteria. So today we're gonna focus on these three points, foundations of airborne contamination, choosing the right monitoring system, and sampling positions and frequency. All right, <clears throat> so let's talk about what it means to be a contaminant. So these days with COVID-19, all we seem to want to do is talk about cleaning. We want to talk about sterilizing. Everybody's trying to steal, you know, isopropanol off of your uh, drugstore shelves. Um, but, but cleaning alone is not a guarantee that you're ready to start food production. You need to understand the space that you're working in. Um, is your area hot? Is it cold? Uh, is the air dry? Is it high humidity? Are you in a country where it is high humidity um, and the filters that are working in your, in your area are exposed to a lot of that humidity? Uh, think about the traffic where people are walking through the area. Is it high traffic, low traffic? Does the area have um, raw foods or raw ingredients? Um, the first step in thinking about monitoring an area for food or for air contaminants for that matter is whether or not the information you're going to gather is going to be helpful, right? So if you go outside and sample the air, is that necessarily helpful for your food manufacturing facility? Because you know there's gonna be mold in the air outside. That's why you're sneezing. That's why your nose is congested. So you start to understand the usefulness of a quality system and its monitoring strategy when you do a risk assessment for the area or products. In um, the United States, we have hazard analysis critical um, control points or HACCP. I can't vouch for the other countries. I know there's quite a few countries that are represented in the chat today, but I guarantee if you have a consumable product, you likely have a risk assessment protocol. So it's essentially a management uh, system. So these risk assessments are a management system uh, in which the food safety is addressed through analysis and control. So you need to be analyzing and controlling the biological, chemical, and physical hazards from raw material production, um, handling the foods, uh, manufacturing, uh, distribution, consumption to the final product. So you need to be thinking about your food being in those areas and the types of particles that are in the air inside those areas. So most contaminants, whether microbiological or chemical, can't be seen by the naked eye. There's this false sense of security, right? When you can't see the problem, it's that old saying, seeing is believing. Well, not necessarily at work when you're working in a food facility. Not seeing means you need to be monitoring. Um, so now, how are you gonna address monitoring the contaminants you're worried about? So over here on the right are three little icons, ISO, SQF, FDA. Maybe you're familiar with them, maybe you aren't. Maybe this is the first time 
you're opening up a food production facility and you need to be, a, and you're trying to learn how to get it started. Um, one thing's for sure that if you have consumable products, either consumed by animals or consumed by humans, you need to be monitoring the contaminants in the air. So these bodies, this ISO, SQF, FDA, um, they have guidance and methods. They have limits, uh, specifications that can be used to guide you or regulate your product depending on your needs. So for ISO, these are international standards built by teams of experts that go and they meet and they discuss the types of um, problems that your areas might have for raw, for dairy, for foods. Um, SQF, it's a, it's a guideline for auditors to make sure that products are being used properly, as well as guidance for quality systems and the FDA uh, here in the States as well. Um, so these are the types of contaminants you can find in ambient air. Now, if you have a clean room, and I know some of you might, uh, these are clean rooms you know, are for raw meats, dairy products, things like that. Um, maybe you won't find all of these, rather hopefully you won't find all of these, but if you're in a general area, these contaminants exist for you. These are particles, water, oil, gas, chemical. Um, so for today, we're going to be focusing on particles only. So particle in the context of a food and beverage clean room is a general term. Uh, it's basically talking about all the sub-visible particles, right? I, we talked a little bit about seeing is believing. Well, you can't see these things. So the main users of clean rooms in food and bev are, are what we talked about a minute ago, like meat and dairy processing plants, uh, specialty foods, things like that. So from, the, from their definition, airborne particle simply refers to particles suspended in the air. And so air contains a variety of these different particles that range in different sizes, right? So the dust on a countertop, when you, you know, streak your finger across it and you can see the line, those are sizable particles, right? It's a, it's a lot of them and they're large. Um, these include particles of dust, uh, dirt, skin, microorganisms, um, and so on. So while there are multiple sources for particle generation, um, personnel and ma our main contributors of particles in clean rooms, as well as the main source of microorganisms. So this is why while a risk can arise from the influx of contaminated air into a clean room or into your food facility, this is less likely to occur within a correctly functioning and monitored area with effective air filtration. So the greater risk is what happens when people shed particles inside of the area that um, the particles are entering the airstream. So does that make sense? And, and you know, I use the analogy again about the perfume and or the cologne, if you can smell it, it's there. So at this point, the organism is a bio aerosol. Does that make sense? So you have a particle. There's no, there's nothing living on the particle of dust. But the minute a microorganism rides that particle like a pony, then suddenly it becomes a bio aerosol if it's suspended in the air. So the most important contamination control issue within um, food processing clean rooms and food processing areas is air. Given that air can contribute, um, can distribute contamination around the facilities, right, through your HVAC systems and things like that. So as well as the way that particles behave in the air with relation to the way that they settle. <clears throat> so we'll talk about settle plates in a little bit. But um, with this regard, particles really should be thought of, um, not thought of rather as a passive contaminant because they're anything but passive. Particles in air are always in flux. So which particles are important to monitor in your facility? Um, particles can be broken down loosely into two terms. You have non-viable particles. You also have viable particles. Uh, here on the left are non-viable um, particles. They do not contain living microorganisms, but they do act as a transportation for viable particles, right? And that's what we're learning during COVID-19. It's funny because, you know, the general public is getting a blast of microbiology 101, um, but you're learning on how to 
put your mask on, how to put your take your mask off. Um, if you're working in healthcare, how to put your clothes on, how to take your clothes off, things like that. So examples of non-viable particles can include metal, uh, rusts, dust, dirt, pollen, fibers, cloth, uh, chemical compounds. This is one that's kind of important. So let's say your food facility is um, add, adding, adding additives uh, or preservatives, uh, any chemicals that are flocculent, like um, let's say sodium, magnesium, potassium, chlorides, things like that, that when you're moving these things, they can cause cross-contamination. Um, excuse me. These particles can be introduced through uh, employee movement um, and product movement. So um, here on the right, uh, this lovely picture of a hand, and let's, I mean, I can't tell you whose hand this was. This wasn't my hand. Uh, it's a stock photo. But um, a viable particle contains one or more living microorganism and can affect the sterility of the product and your employee's health. So um, we do know that everybody has microorganisms on people, right? We know that's a thing. Everybody's been talking about viruses, um, bacteria, mold, but um, that is what differentiates between a non-viable particle and a viable particle. So the next question you need to ask yourself is which one does my facility need to care about? So depending on your risk assessment, the area that you're producing food or consumable products needs to have a system in place that prevents airborne contamination. So the good thing and the bad thing about a lot of these standards is the vagueness. Um, depending on the type of area, it is not vague if you're in a clean room, but the vagueness of this requirement is all over regulatory bottom uh, bodies like SQF or ISO. But one thing is certain, you cannot prevent what you're not monitoring. And that is the easiest way to do prevention, right? Is to be proactive and not reactive. Um, the temperature in these food clean rooms is strictly controlled along with the humidity and the number of particles in the room. So such an extremely, extremely tightly sterile and controlled environment it's meant to provide a safe place for your food products to be produced and processed and packaged. But if you're not monitoring those things, then you're really leaving that, you know, you're leaving that, uh, you're leaving that out. And so enabling the manufacturer uh, to increase the shelf life of your product by monitoring viable particles is a big deal. And, you know, most importantly, and I think that everybody in the world, given that we're in the middle of a pandemic, um, we have felt this, is that the health of our employees is the health of our company and our product. So congratulations. I have convinced you without a shadow of a doubt that your product needs to be in an environmental monitored, um, your product needs to be in an area that's being monitored for particulates, right? So the next question you need to ask me is how do I do this? Um, how do I know which instrument to use, which method is best? Um, you know, there's so many things out there if you hit um, ambient air testing. So how do I know what I need to do? So <clears throat> you're ready to start testing for particle contamination. Uh, there really isn't much of a better way to do it uh, than with a laser particle counter. Now, keep mind of the types of words that I'm saying. I'm saying particle counting, right? I'm not differentiating yet between non-viable and viable particles. So just be mindful of that. We'll get there. So <clears throat> ISO 14644-1, the international standard for classification of air cleanliness defines a particle counter as a light scattering device that has the capacity to display real-time particle counts bend by size ranges. So this binning, um, and binning is a term used for uh, putting multiple sizes into a range. So this binning in conjunction with sample flow and sample time equate to a particle concentration by air volume. So taking the area of your sample monitoring um, area, you'll be able to extrapolate the particle concentration in that zone that you test for. Uh, so the capacity of measurement binning is dependent on the make and model of the particle counter. Um, however, this is 
a generalized size, this um, 0.1 uh, micrometer to 10 micrometer. It's a generalized size range. You can also find some portable and handheld laser counters that go higher. Um, I haven't personally seen one that goes lower, but that doesn't mean that it's not out there. Um, for record keeping, you get the capacity to use the USB keys. Uh, some come with Bluetooth technology. Uh, what a lot of people who like to use, um, hang on one sec. What a lot of people like <clears throat> to do is set alert and alarm volume settings. So let's say you're going to take a, a five minute sample and you don't want to hover over your sampler. What you can do is set an alert and alarm volume. And so when a threshold is passed on your handheld LPC, it'll send an alert, an audible alert to you to say, hey, you need to get up. We failed. <laughs> or, hey, um, you know, uh, your five minute sample time is up. Your one minute sample time is up. Your cycle is up. Um, but that's what these volume settings are for. Um, and then there's multiple data point storage capacity for both of these styles. So <clears throat> here are two options for optical particle counters. An optical particle counter, um, it works on the principle of either light scattering or light blocking. Um, so an airstream, I don't know if you can see my pointer, but an airstream will go, will get drawn into the chamber or into the sample input area. So on the left, we see uh, two different types of LPCs, laser particle counters. Um, it'll get drawn into the chamber with a light source. So either a, a laser base light or some sort of white light. And then when the particle is illuminated by this light beam, it's redirected or absorbed. And so the light scattered by a single particle in a specific direction in relation to the original direction has a unique signature which relates to the size of the particle. And so that signature is dictated by calibration. Um, and so you can get your instrument calibrated um, a variety of ways, but the ones that we have here at Trace, which incidentally are the ones here on the screen, are calibrated with spherical um, niche traceable beads. And so the size bins that we get our, our instrument calibrated to are based on those niche traceable beads. So you can always change the threshold of the channels based on the size of the bin that you want. So this allows for sizing and counting of the individual particles. And there are a few different types of particle counters. These are the two most common. Um, and we also have them here at Trace. Um, here on the right, um, this little handheld particle counter, it's uh, small, it's about the size of a large flashlight or a small little handheld vacuum. It, it's a little bit smaller than a handheld vacuum. It's a portable, self-contained device. You can clean it. It's got HEPA filters on it. Um, you can use it for HEPA filters. You can use it inside a laminar flow hood. Uh, you can use it on a clean bench, things like that. Um, they can detect and count physical particles as small as 0.3 microns. Um, up to 10. Um, again, it's based on the channel that's accessible for that actual that actual model and make. They provide uh, convenience for you for data capturing. I think you can kind of see it and here on the screen, but um, you can see the index has the built-in screen. Um, one of the cons is that price is often determined by the particle size capacity. So the number of airflow channels that it has? Uh, does it have the option of doing air temperature, relative humidity? Does it have Wi-Fi connectivity? Uh, things like that. So when you're thinking about um, the pros and cons of a laser particle counter, you know, it always comes down to price as well. So um, these are typically used for short-term sampling times. So it is handheld. I mean, it's got that kickstand on the back, but also it's not something you want to use for hours. Um, or days rather. So it's typically used for short term. Here um, on the left is a benchtop portable particle counter. Uh, we have the AeroTrack here and it features a larger touchscreen, which is nice. 
Um, it's pretty streamlined. What you do is typically you put it on a cart. You can roll it into your area. It's got the user-friendly interface. It's got a printer built in, which is pretty cool. Um, again, it's also calibrated. Uh, you get the certifications um, for all your models. And so the benchtop models handle a higher volume of air, more so than the handheld. So you need to be mindful of that when you're thinking about particle counting. Um, and these are typically dedicated for long-term monitoring um, and certifications for your areas. And what's not pictured are remote particle counters. And they're used to continually monitor airborne particle levels in real time. Um, they don't have a built-in display. They're usually connected to your uh, quality system or your quality facilities acquisition system to monitor the, the um, overall performance of your clean room and the air ventilation, but they act in the same manner. So basically to summarize, you get the real-time direct measurements that are accurate to the calibration that your instrument has. And we'll talk about that in a second. And some can measure down to 0.1 micron. But remember, these do not differentiate between viable bacteria, yeast, and mold, and non-viable particles. You get the option of portable and handheld. And some of these have spec printouts. And it's pretty cool. Um, you get real-time specification analysis. But again, um, you know, it comes down to expense. What are you willing to pay for? And do, does it differentiate between viable and non-viable? It does not. <clears throat> so I did touch on a little bit about the uh, calibration requirements. So here, um, both of these styles of OPCs, which are optical particle counters, um, have annual calibration requirements based on the ISO 21501-4. Um, if you have an optical aerosol spectrometer, um, that is a different ISO standard, but both require NIST traceable components for the annual calibration. Um, and it's pretty pricey. So, you know, it's always nice to be able to go to a third plate, a third party and rent them, things like that, especially if you're only needing to do it quarterly or semi-annually. Um, but the great thing about the calibration documents and is that it allows you to have precise and accurate particle results um, when it comes to sizing and counting the instrument. So um, a lot of you guys will have facilities that are large um, and your quality department will need to create a testing schematic for particles. Um, you'll notice here I have the P's for particles. So let's say your quality department is requiring you to do multiple samples in an area it's easier and it's less time on your technician if you're using multiple, uh, let's say, handheld particle counters. If you're using multiple handheld particle counters, instead of doing five rounds of one, one minute sampling in three places, which would equate to your technician using 15 minutes of their time, they can do five minutes of their time if they had three. So just be mindful of that um, when you're doing handheld, when you're when you're trying to figure out, do I want to do handheld versus portable versus remote? Those are options as well, because time is money and you need your technicians focused on production. <clears throat> All right, here comes the fun part. So what if you need to differentiate between viable and non-viable? What if it's time for you to answer the age-old question, how many bacteria, yeast, and mold do I have in my area? And so um, this here is a picture of a Petri dish. Uh, this, in fact, is a contact plate, 55 millimeters. It's pretty small. Um, the cool thing about this is when you need to evaluate viable particles in your sampled area, there's two standard types. There's passive sampling and there's active sampling. So passive sampling is um, what we discussed earlier in my talk, which is settle plates. Now, the thing that you need to remember is if a particle is so small, it's likely that it won't settle, right? Because people keep moving, air flows, your AC kicks on, things like that. So some particles are too small to settle and some particles aren't. 
So if you're worried about things like that or um, high risk areas that have passed your risk assessment that need to be controlled uh, for surface, you can do surface swabs as well, but settle plates is where it's at. So that's passive sampling. The other type is active sampling. Um, and it's pretty common for uh, pump sampling. So like I said, it's a glorified um, <laughs> vacuum cleaner. And so what you see here is the, the plate sits on the base, you close it. Um, they have disposable ones for sterile rooms. They have uh, stainless steel ones that can be autoclave, so it's st uh, sterilized, things like that. And then the air comes in through there and you can test it on an impaction sampler basis. So again, the air input goes directly onto the plate if it's a settle plate. And here, um, the sample input is an impaction uh, sampler. So it will hit the plate when it gets sucked in. So the cool thing about that is you get air volume control. So you get to dictate, hey, I need to sample 1,000 liters or one cubic meter. Um, and instead of taking hours or instead of you know, taking multiple like minutes, 30, 40, 50 minutes, we have, um, or not we, the royal we, engineers have designed pumps that can do 200 liters per minute, 100 liters per minute. So your sampling time is now reduced from hours to just minutes. So this here is a Trio Boss Mono. It can do 200 liters per minute at a five minute uh, interval, which will give you one cubic meter. Um, the cool thing about this too, is you get the option of choosing different microbiological media, which we're gonna talk about in a minute. Uh, it has the ability to um, detect down to less than one colony forming unit detected at the time of testing. I cannot stress this enough. Microbiologists will never say it's like, it's, it's scary if you hear a microbiologist say, oh, it's sterile, right? It, things are small. So less than one is about as close as you'll ever get to us saying zero. So, the, um, so that's the level of detection that you can get with sample plates as well as um, uh, air samplers. And so there's portable, they're also portable and handheld. These are pretty small, like I said, small vacuum. Um, the expense is based on the technique. So you can get a Petri dish that is a couple bucks, or you can get a handheld sampler that's a couple thousand dollars. Uh, settle plates are typically time consuming. Um, air sampler, I told you, is around five minutes a sample if you want to do one cubic meter. You can always extrapolate uh, based on the air, based on the area that you're testing, you can always extrapolate. Um, how many microorganisms are in that area. But again, it does not detect non-viable particles. And it also doesn't detect bacteria, yeast, or mold that is no longer living, right? So that is now, so if a bacteria, lysis, mold is dead, or whatever, that is now considered non-viable. So this isn't going to test that. This is strictly going to test viable organisms. And so when you're thinking about what type of microbiological media do I need to be using, this is, this is the fun part for microbiologists. I get to explain to you how you get to diversify the reports for your quality system. So if you wanna use broad spectrum, which is here at the top, what is broad spectrum? Well, it's exactly what it's saying, it's broad. It's a nutrient auger. Um, which allows the growth of bacteria, yeast, and mold. Now, if there's a microbiologist in the room, they're probably going, well, I mean, come on. Some things inhibit the growth of other things. Right, exactly right. And that's why we're saying, um, and we'll talk about it in a little bit, how many samples you need to take. But for the most part, broad spectrums where it's at, this is typically TSA, triptych soy auger. It can be nutrient auger. It can be... Um, What's the other one? Like sheep's blood, uh, uh, plate count auger, things like that. Um, so that'll grow bacteria, yeast, and mold. The next one is up is differential. So let's say you are creating kombucha, right? Everybody loves it. Um, 
and you want to make sure there's no mold in the area because you have other biologicals that you're going to add in. Let's say you need to specifically uh, test for mold. Well, in that case, that is a differential media. So there are like antibacterials that are added to the recipe of the gelatin on the plate that inhibit the growth of bacteria so that the only thing that does grow is the fungus or is the bacteria or um, is the specific strain. So that's called differential. Uh, things like that are uh, SDA, Sabron dextrose auger, MEA, uh, malt extract auger. Malt extract auger. Um, and those, uh, the examples I just gave will um, inhibit a large amount of bacterial uh, contamination and allow for the growth of fungal organisms. And then my favorite, because everybody loves colors, is selective, right? It's chromogenic. It's me saying, okay, I did a broad spectrum analysis. I found a lot of bacteria. I'm freaking out a little bit. I need to know, is this Listeria? Is this Salmonella? Is this Staph aureus? Is this E. coli, right? So chromogenic is a enzymatic act, is an enzymatic additive that goes into the petri dish um i'm sorry that goes into the auger right so now it's a new recipe and it causes colometric changes it causes the the target organism to catalyze the chemical and allow the growth of the organism to appear a different color and so it's a lock and key mechanism um, so that's chromogenic. And this really cool picture here, it's not mine, I wish it was, because it's really cool. Um, you have E. coli up here, it's pink, uh, Klebsiella, Prote Proteus, Mirabilis probably, uh, Enterococcus, and you got some Staph aureus. So E. coli, Klebsiella, uh, Enterococcus, these are, these are different types of um, organisms which can be deleterious to your food products. E. coli, Klebsiella, these are coliforms, right? They're found typically in the uh, intestine of warm-blooded animals. And so what does that mean? That should not be showing up in your food. That should not be showing up in the air. So, you know, these are super inexpensive ways of testing it for indicator organisms quickly, right? If you're wanting more specific, so all three types of this analysis are called presumptive analysis. Um, the other type of analysis is called um, confirmatory analysis. Um, and we'll be here all week if I, if I talked about it all. So definitely shoot me an email or give me a call if you have any questions. But um, these are presumptive. Confirmatory is, hey, I got a hit on E. coli on my, on my um, chromogenic plate. Maria, I need you to tell me with a surety that this is E. coli. Well, it, confirmatory works on the, uh, the DNA or the proteins or the metabolic fingerprints, the metabolic enzymatic activities um, of the specific organism based so it, it's compared to a library, and then that gives you a qual value that tells you whether or not that is in fact the organism. And so those are cellular confirmatory responses, PCR, um, uh, phenotypic analysis of multiple uh, enzymatic reactions, right? So that's confirmatory. So um, going back to the importance of the calibration requirement is making sure that the airflow is precise and accurate. So when you are pulling, you want to make sure that your instrument is capable of pulling at the exact flow rate um, that you're requiring because you don't want to underestimate or overestimate your bio burden in the area. So um, these have annual calibration requirements for for traceable components. So that's all there as well. So when the lab sees your results, this is how they're typically going to see them. They're going to see them as countable plates, which is here on the left. So sometimes um, 
these this can be settle plates if they look like this. They can also be um, impaction samplers that look like this. Um, but these are all countable. If you see a report that says TNTC, stands for too numerous to count, um, and the lab will generally say it's greater than 250 cubic, uh, cubic, 250 colony forming units per cubic meter. Um, and that's typically because we have lost the assurance that the uh, analyst can count beyond that due to the high burden of organisms. And you can tell because they start butting up next to each other. They start looking like figure eights and things like that. They're on top of each other. So um, that's kind of what your reports will look like if your burden is so high. And you always need to be in cons uh, inconsiderate of the incubation time when you're doing these things. Um, talk to your quality department, talk to a microbiologist with recommendations on how long to um, incubate for. Uh, a lot of the specifications don't give you incubation uh, requirements. So, you know, definitely get yourself on the phone with somebody who can help you out because being a compressed air laboratory who's, you know, venturing into ambient air testing, there's not supposed to be any growth in your compressed air. So, so incubating for 10 days is going to look very different on an ambient plate. So just be mindful of that. Um, the next thing we're going to talk about is sampling positions and frequency. So how many samples do you need to be taking? And so that's kind of what I wanted to talk about for a little bit when you're thinking about, okay, is, you know, I'm sampling once a year, you know, do I just need to check the box and just use one plate? Well, think about uh, the area of the room. Uh, does your quality department want you to test 50% of that room? And so if it is 50% of the room or 25% of the room, you need to think about area. And then when you're thinking about area, you need to think about flow rate. Is your flow rate extrapolating under or over that estimated area? Same with maintenance. So this is a real kicker in my opinion. Um, you know, we've talked a little bit about the importance of particles, both viable and non-viable, being kicked up by people. Nothing kicks up more dust than when you're fixing something, right? So think about when you're at home and you're cleaning your, your cabinets and you haven't opened them for a while or whatever, and there's dust everywhere. Well, the same thing happens for some equipment, right? Some of this equipment that you guys have are thousands of pounds, hundreds of pounds. You're not moving it all the time. So if there is um, movement or maintenance or air filter changes, think about that. You need to be testing after maintenance, after changes, after air filter changes. Um, all that stuff's important. Um, and then minimal and single. So these are pretty related. And you, you, know, you ask yourself, is one sample enough? Um, I think it's important to really talk about what it means to have a control. So I already told you we live in a microbial soup, right? So how are you going to confirm that your microbial sample is actually the microbes in that area and not what you contaminated? So what you need to have is a control plate, a sterility blank, something that says, hey, this media was right next to my sample plate. It is not contaminated. Therefore, I know that that plate uh, determines the level of aseptic technique that my technician had when he or she sampled. So how many samples? It's up to your risk assessment and your quality, but I will tell you, I definitely need to be seeing some controls because I want to make sure that your technician is using proper aseptic technique. How often do you test? This is my favorite, annual, semi-annual, quarterly. Look, you know there's multiple seasons in the year. And there's a wet season, a dry season, a cold season, and a blazing hot season, unless you're in Texas, in which case we get all the seasons in one day. Um, in either case, you guys need to be taking into account the weather outside, especially if you have, you know, um, non-clean room areas, which means the HVAC systems 
aren't uh, specialized in isolated systems. If you're just out on the floor or if you have a, um, you know, your doors open, your distribution area has doors open and you're you're subject to the elements outside, you need to be testing quarterly. If you're doing swab tests, why don't you do it daily? You know, you can do contact surface of your personnel daily. Those things are inexpensive. It takes seconds to do. The longest part is just packaging it up. But for ambient particulates, you know, I recommend quarterly because that's the number of seasons in the year. But a lot of specifications only require annual. But you need to be thinking less about checking the box and more about keeping the quality of your product high. So where do I test? This is where you, you really need to sit with your quality manager and your quality department and discuss risk assessments. Um, I'm not gonna go through it because a risk assessment is essentially a whole nother webinar, but if you have high risk or low risk areas, it can determine how many uh, sampling points you have. Um, so just be mindful of that. A lot of these SQF, a lot of these, uh, uh, specifications are dependent on the answer of risk assessments. So definitely think about that when you're moving forward with the number of samples and the amount of time that you're testing. So in summary, what did we learn today? We learned that air is contaminated with particles. So give me a call because I'm gonna help you out. Um, there is viable and non-viable categories inside of particles, right? And so non viable so if you're going to use a laser particle counter you're going to get both but it's not going to differentiate between viable and a lot of you guys care about viable organisms the risk assessment is going to determine how you start to build this strong testing strategy to build a healthy and to build a he healthy food and beverage quality system that's dependent on monitoring particles that are both viable and non-viable. So I appreciate you guys listening to me today. Uh, with that, I'm going to take questions. Um, I think Simon's going to pop on here in a second. And um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> OK, um, thanks very much for that, Maria. Uh, excellent overview. And uh, uh, let's dive one straight second. in. I, you're breaking up. Oh, still breaking up. Can you? Am I? Oh, um, I tell you what. I'll yep, highlight the question. Up. Let me see. Can, can you see the question? Mm, <laughs> nope, still breaking up. Really? That's strange. Um, no, still breaking up. No good. There. Right there. Okay, I'm ready. All right. Okay. Brilliant. Phew. Uh, <laughs> this, this is the last Food Safety Friday of 2020, so Aww. we don't we don't want any gremlins. Anyway, I've highlighted the first question. Uh, I just said sorry. Uh, thanks very much for the overview. That was great, Maria. So yes, questions. Fernando. Can you see that question? Uh, Fernando from Miami, what is the benchmark standard for airborne organisms in ambient air in a food processing plant? So that's all gonna come down to um, your risk assessment, your quality department, what country you're in. Um, but if you wanna start at a really great um, international standard, which, you know, can umbrella a lot of countries and a lot of regulatory bodies, you may want to start at ISO 14644. Um, and that has a really great uh, ISO class standard for air cleanliness by particle concentration. So again, that's ISO 14644. There's a few parts in there and you can check it out. But yeah, it's a great place to start. Okay, and next one, Luz Viminda. Uh, we are in a fruit and vegetable processing plant. What monitoring method is applicable to control air contaminants? Yeah, and so that's exactly what we talked about today. It depends on what type of air contaminants, but with fruits and vegetables, right, I would recommend um, both a 
active air sampler. So something that pulls in the air. I would also recommend surface swabs because a lot of these fruits and vegetables are gonna be washed. They're gonna be on conveyor belts, things like that. And laser particle counters, which are going to uh, tell you the number of particles in the air, not differentiating between viable and non-viable. So if you do the viable test and the laser particle test, you'll be able to capture this really great image of the system that you have uh, in your area. So if you do end up having an influx of particles, let's say uh, two quarters later, and you test again, and you find out that it's not the number of non-viable particles that increased, it's in fact the number of viable particles that increased, then that's really great information that you would not have had if you only did laser particle counts, right? So you would have had it in the sense that you would have known that there was an increase, but you would have never known what type of increase. And so when it comes to consumable foods like fruits and vegetables, especially with like lettuces and legumes, you know, those are always around coliforms or animals with, you know, warm blooded animals. Um, it's a big deal. So being able to differentiate between those two is super important. Okay. Uh, Bruce, um, you mentioned price as a con on your pros and cons. Approximately, what do these counters cost? Is yeah, so some of the laser particle counters, uh, again, depending on the type that you get, there is optical aerosol spectrometers that do um, aerosol particle counts. There are also optical particle counters. Um, and inside the optical particle counters, there are portable, remote, handheld, um, and so those can range between hundreds of thousands of dollars for a system that is like Wi-Fi ready, continuous monitoring to a couple thousand dollars for one that doesn't go down to the smallest micrometer um, and is handheld. So it's really, you know, anywhere between thousands to hundreds of thousands of dollars, depending on the system that you create. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, John, can food-related viruses, HEP A and Noro, be detected with existing technology? Same question about COVID-19. Yeah, I knew this was coming. I knew it would be someone. Um, so here's the thing about viruses. Viruses <laughs> are not viable organisms, right? A virus alone cannot replicate. A virus needs to infect an organic substrate, like your nose, uh, and then it can replicate. A virus is a particle. So a virus can ride a non-viable particle. So what does that mean? A virus, so if you want to test for viruses specifically, you need to get an air sampler that can, um, and there's a few out there on the market that can pull onto a filter. And then a, it's gotta be a microbiology lab that can um, do this, it's called a plaque assay. So the filter encapsulates the virus that is typically uh, attached to a particle. Uh, viruses are very, very, very small. They're smaller than, um, uh, most bacteria and definitely smaller than yeasts and molds. Um, it, they'll, they'll get encapsulated onto this filter membrane. You'll send that filter to a third party laboratory. That laboratory will then take that filter um, and put it onto a, a virus containing media called a plaque assay that they can do. And that, that uh, recipe has organic substrates in there that allows the viruses to grow and you can quantify that way. The other way you can do it is with PCR technology, that's polymerase chain reaction, that's um, blowing the viral particles apart, getting the RNA or DNA from those particles, and then analyzing it against the library that's known. Uh, those are really sophisticated techniques and not something that can be done. And none of that can be done with the systems that we talked about today. The only thing that can be done in terms of viral particles is just encapsulating the number of non-viable particles in your area, but it will not, using the media that we have, 
shown today be used for viruses. Okay, thanks for that. It's very informative. Uh, Marugan, at what distance the sampling shall be done for HEPA filters? Um, again, totally up to you. I would be curious um, what happens before the HEPA filter compared to what happens after the HEPA filter, if that's possible. You know what I'm saying? Upstream and downstream of the HEPA filter. Um, but you definitely want to go to the floor, so like settle plates, and you definitely want to go to um, areas that are drafty, so doorways, when the, uh, different, when the pressure differential uh, occurs, so when you open a door and things like that. Okay, and uh, Mokesh, um, what should be air filter replacement frequency? Yeah, so every HEPA filter or every air ventilation uh, system has a requirement on their filter. So whatever filter you have, it's as easy as going online or look, talking to your distributor about um, the frequency of change, but you guys need to be um, staying up on that because especially right now, the uh, less microbial load that is on a filter, the better it works, right? So that doesn't mean you need to change it every day, but if that, but you need to adhere to the requirements of the filters that you are currently using. Okay. Uh, yes, John, um, the slide deck will be issued afterwards with the recording, so don't worry about that. Um, Christopher, quite a long question. Uh, for laser particle counter, the handheld and portable, would the personnel holding the counter bias the counter's test results? That is, the personnel, the tester, contaminate the con counter first. What is the added preventive measure on the tester to avoid such bias? Yeah, that's a really great question. And so the way the instrument counteracts that is there's a thing called a hold timer. So let's say, let's say Simon and I are racing, right? Simon, you just got your hip replaced. I'm going to be faster than you today. So <laughs> yeah. you can have, <laughs> you can have a hold time of a minute before the sampler starts. Whereas if I'm faster than you, I can have a hold time of 10 seconds and run out of the room before the sampler starts. So that's how this equipment is set up. Um, let's say uh, you it, it's such a large room that it takes five minutes to transverse it. Well, you can set the hold time to five minutes before the sampling starts. Okay, I knew you'd get me hip replacement in <laughs> somehow. <laughs> somehow. Uh, Dilanka, uh, how can we ensure the quality of air taken for ice cream production, microbial quality, airborne contaminants, etc.? So when it comes to ensuring the quality of air taken, you need to be either using somebody who is trained in aseptic technique or you have a third party laboratory that has um, like has training videos and a certificate that can be printed out for the quality management system that you have on site that can um, verify that your technician has watched the videos and has learned the proper technique. Um, the other way of doing it is getting a distributor who is properly trained um, to do aseptic technique. Um, and that's all to say aseptic technique is definitely required when you're taking any sort of microbial sampling. Um, particle counting is a little bit different um, because particles are everywhere all the time. Uh, but, and there's that hold time that I talked about a minute ago. But in terms of ensuring the quality, it's always about aseptic te technique training and ensuring that you have the proper number of controls to verify the validity of your test. Okay, Merlin, uh, how do you know how much air to be sampled in areas? What quantity to set on the air sampler? Yeah, so that's um, based on the size of the area. So you're basically going to do, uh, you know, geom geometry 101. You're going to take the area of your room, determine how much air it would take to, to fill the room up, and then you can either sample a subset of that and then extrapolate the total volume in that area, 
or you can set it on you know 32 hours push play uh, for a laser particle counter and do that. Now I will say this is caveated by microorganism uh, media is super susceptible to humidity. So organisms need water activity content to, to um, remain viable and to replicate. So uh, microbial tests are never longer than about 15 minutes um, unless you have a certain type of media. Okay, thank you. Bria, once monitoring has been set in place, are this, have you got any suggestions for minimizing or decreasing the microbial load of the air? Oh, yeah. Filters. Filter, filter, filters. All day. Okay, that's easy enough. Uh, Joan, um, how, uh, let me, sorry, I missed that one. Joan, um, how do I know which type of viable and non viable particulates we need to test in a food manufacturing plant? So um, a lot of the times that'll be in the standard that your quality department will choose for your risk assessment dictated area. It's a mouthful. Um, so some areas where let's say it's the loading dock, your, your food is already packaged up, you just need to make sure there's not a large increase of particulates, then it's probably just an, a quarterly, annual, uh, non-viable particle test, or just a particle test, right? But if it's the raw meats, they're out and they are not packaged, it's probably a daily or weekly air monitoring test um, for bacteria, yeast, and molds, and um, things like that. So it's all really dependent on the use of the area and your risk assessment. Okay. Alison, uh, have you any specific recommendations for a raw, frozen dough plant? Or, um... I mean, it's all the same, right? Um, the organism that you're looking for is bacteria, yeast, and mold. So the sampler doesn't care if it's raw or frozen. It doesn't care if it's dry. It doesn't care if it's big or small, fruit, spinach, you know, a whole animal. It doesn't care. So that's the good news when you're looking at these samplers is that you're, you're trying to dictate rather flow and type of sampling, sterile or non-sterile, it doesn't matter um, about the actual sampler itself. Okay. And Merlin, again, should we always position the air samplers near air ducts, AC vents? Ours is a flight food production company. Yeah. So you definitely, and I talked about it a little bit, you definitely want to be upstream of an air filter so you know what your baseline is, right? And you want to be downstream of your air filter so you know is your air filter working properly? Because if you're upstream of your air filter and it's got 100 CFU, and then you're downstream of your air filter in your, in your storage area, and you've got 500 CFUs, well, you know that that air filter is failing you and you have some sort of issue, some biofilm somewhere that's causing a five-time uptick into your holding area. So. When you're thinking about that, you need to be thinking about the story that the results are going to tell you. If they tell you that something's contaminated, how are you going to know how contaminated it is if you're not going to test an area that's either before the maintenance or, or upstream of your filter, things like that? Okay, great. <clears throat> Tammy, uh, suggestions for correct faction when your counts are higher than spec? The first thing I want to tell you guys is don't panic. A lot of these specifications are not here to ruin your lives. They're not here to freak you out. They're not here to shut down your plant. What they are here, and if you're doing a good job, what they are here is to tell you what's happening at any given moment in your facility. Here's the problem with annual testing. A lot can happen in a year, right? It hasn't been a year, at least in the United States, since we heard about COVID-19. Hasn't been a year yet, but a lot has happened since then. 
And so if you're telling me that you've only tested once a year, but all of this stuff has happened, it's deleterious. So if I were to tell you, hey, you know, do a corrective action, I would increase my number of samples. I would say, all right, we failed. A corrective action is to increase the amount of times we sample so that instead of catching, catching it 12 months later, we can catch it within a quarter or six months, something like that. Um, and of course, it goes, if it is an corrective action for air sampling, <clears throat> look at your filters. Did you hire somebody new? That's one thing that I wanted to talk about and I forgot. Um, hiring new personnel is a big deal, right? So you need to be monitoring. You can do contact, uh, contact microbial surface test with a contact plate that I showed earlier. And you just do a gentle uh, press against the chest or against the gloves uh, in a sterile area. This doesn't work if you're in a non-sterile area. So, you know, it's a moot point because it's going to be dirty no matter what. But think about new personnel and new techniques that might have been lost along the way. Great. Brilliant. Uh, Willie, um, is it useful to use Petrofilm for air sampling? Yeah, that's fine. Uh, Petrofilm is, a. Um, so for you guys who don't know what that is, it's considered a dry contact plate. So like the ones you saw in the picture that I had, uh, it had a uh, like a yellow orangish gelatin in it. Uh, Petrofilm plate is, or Petrofilm plate is a dry contact. So imagine that it's a filter now that has the capacity to hold high water activity and it allows the microorganism to stay viable on that film for uh, transport to a third party laboratory. But that still has to be, um, has, to, has to have additives onto it. But air sampling on that is perfectly fine. Like I said, these are not all the methods that are available for air sampling, but they're really great foundational ones to look into. Okay, Zoe, how can an upper limit of air contamination be set in the food industry for fishery products? Yeah, so that's gonna go, um, I mean, I, I hate to say this, you know, because it feels like I'm just passing off the question, but that is a, a risk assessment that you guys are going to have to do. Um, and there are a lot. And, you know, I encourage you guys, especially here on the IFSQN uh, blogs to talk to each other. You know, if you're having issues figuring out what the upper limit is, I guarantee you there's somebody else here who's got a fishery, uh, who's got fishery products who can help you out. So you know, definitely get on the IFSQN blogs and talk to each other. And, um, you know, you'll figure it out together. But it's always easy to, uh, but if you don't want to ask for help, right, you want to do this all on your own. Start with a baseline. Start with a baseline, you know, and say that your alert level is 5, 10, 15% of that. But, um, you know, that, those are my recommendations. Yeah. I'll put the link to the discussion forum in the uh, sidebar. Don't go now, but later, bookmark it and register. It's free. And, yeah, do use it and ask. Answers are there. Um, <clears throat> Dilanka, how can we ensure the quality of air taken for ice cream production, microbial quality, airborne, contaminants, etc.? cetera? Oh, uh, yeah, we answered that one. You've done that one. Sorry. Yeah. No, you're uh, da, 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 da. Senthil, um, do we have any specification for microbial limits in, in environmental samples? So environmental samples, um, that can be a couple of things. It can be water. <clears throat> it can be soil. It can be air. Um, I'll address air. Um, like I said, ISO 14644-1 is a great guidance tool. Uh, if you're in the United States, you need to be looking at FSMA, uh, food safety uh, with the FDA. If you're um, you know, overseas or you're an SQF auditor or an SQF lab, you need to be looking into that. If you're a GMP lab, 
um, I'm sorry, GMP facility. Um, you need to be looking into good manufacturing practices. And a lot of that is upheld by ISO standards and FDA standards. So um, at least here in the United States. So look into those type things. But if you need a starting point, ISO 14644 is a great place to start. Okay, uh, Paul, how, uh, how should we relate air particles to allergen residue risk? Yeah, so that's a really cleanly put question because allergens um, are often time. So allergens can be a couple of things. Allergens can be pollen, non-viable particle. Allergens can be parts of exploded bacteria, non-viable. Allergens can be toxins excreted from viable fungi, not viable, not a viable product, a uh, non-viable particle. So all of those types of allergen inducing things are predominantly non-viable, but fungal organisms themselves like mold can create allergens. So sometimes, um, Sometimes particle number is related to allergens just based on load, but there's no, I don't have an answer for how they're directly related when it comes to allergen residue. Okay, thanks. Uh, Kavita, where to keep air plates in a factory environment? We are a chilled vegetable processing factory. So there are some recipes of testing um, there are some recipes of microbial media that can be housed unopened at um, ambient room temperature. But you need to remember ambient room temperature in Texas is very different than ambient room temperature in India than ambient room temperature in London. So ambient room temperature in general is around 70, uh, is around 25 degrees Celsius or 77 degrees Fahrenheit. There's also um, recipes that require plates to be refrigerated because a lot of these additives, uh, let's say for chromogenic, the ones where the colors change because of the enzymatic activity, a lot of that needs to be refrigerated. So um, you may need a refrigerator. One cool thing if you're um, using us, we send uh, coolers that have been validated so you can take it with an ice pack and then travel around your area and then send it back to us in a cooler. Uh, and that system's been validated. But if you're in a refrigerated area, as long as you can maintain the uh, OEMs, the original equipment manufacturer's recommendation for temperature storage on your plates, you'll be fine. Okay, brilliant. Uh, John, for beverage bottling, would the viable test suffice for ambient air testing we would like to confirm if 30 minutes of exposure plate will do during production does that make sense yeah it makes sense and my answer to that is probably not right so if you had answered it the other way depends i would answer it depends on if your bottle is open or if it's closed so viable testing does not take into account the non-viable number. So viable testing is only going to give you half of the story of the number of particles in your bottle facility. But if you take a non-viable, if you take a particle counting test, right, but if you want to use an LPC, you're going to get both viable and non-viable particles. Um, but you're only getting half of the story if you're only taking a settle plate for 30 minutes. Um, so okay. it depends on the risk. Isabel, uh, for settle plates, is there an equivalency between length of exposure time and air volume? Yeah, so um, I think right now, at least in the United States, the EPA requirement for a settle plate is somewhere around four, four hours four hours and no more than 15 colonies per for 15 minutes or something like that. Um, there is an equivalency out there. So there is a calculation to look at it. Uh, it escapes me right now. So 
uh, but there is a calculation out there for settle plates. Okay, James, how should we, we relate air particles to food spoilage? So that's a little bit different. So food spoilage, uh, you need to be testing. So there's a lot of things to ask about that. Is your food spoiling inside of the uh, modified atmospheric packaging? And then in which case that's a compressed air question. Um, is your food spoiling while it's outside of the packaging and exposed to ambient air? In which case that's a viable particle uh, question. Uh, spoilage to a microbiologist means that um, the quality of the uh, product is going down based on the number of uh, bacteria, yeast, and mold that are consuming it. Um, so that would be more of a viable particulate question. But if you have food spoilage, I think typically uh, food manufacturers have food testing for that as well. Okay, Oi, uh, what if the production environment is already dusty by nature, such as powder, fly, flour, dry ingredients, raw yeah. spices? Uh, this is a this is a really cool question because uh, we had a we had a customer one time who had a flour business, and so it was like everything was very white. They tried their hardest to do ambient air, and then our equipment came back. And it looked like it snowed all over it. <laughs> um, in that case, you would call that uh, you would call that um, an inappropriate area to test for airborne particulates because it's already contaminated. And so that's part of the uh, early part of my talk, which was how useful is this information going to be for you? Don't waste time or money you know, doing air sampling in an area that you know is covered in powder and dust. Instead, you need to be doing surface contact. You need to be seeing what's settling on your production line, what's settling on, um, you know, your raw products. And so that you can do uh, either a settle plate or that you can do swabs and contact. Okay, uh, apt type of bacteria analysis, analysis in air and surface and hand workers. Hand. Anything. So if you can recall back to one of the pictures, I had the handprint. So you can get a gram positive. So um, gram stain, gram stain tells you the type of cell wall that the organism has. Uh, there are some organisms that have non-determinant, um, that are non-determinant based on the species and genus of the organism. For the most part though, you can tell gram positive from gram negative. And what that means is a thick cell wall or a thin cell wall. Um, so there's Staph aureus, right? You, you, like Staph infections or Staph aureus is found on the top of your skin or staphylococcus epidermidis is on the top of your skin. Uh, e. coli is inside of your intestines, right? So if you have somebody who's not well versed in proper hygiene, when they use the restroom and they go back into the production line and you swab their hands and it pops positive for a coliform, a coliform is a group of gram negative organisms that are found in the intestines of warm blooded um, organisms, uh, then you know you have an issue with hygiene on your production line. Or one of the cool things, we found uh, coliforms in compressed air one time because the birds um, were pooping near the intake of the compressed air tank and that was contaminating their distribution line. So when it comes to bacteria, all kinds. How's that for a terrible answer? <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, you're on big overtime here, uh, Maria. It was supposed to be an hour. We're on at one hour twenty. We'll have to set the cut off at one thirty, but let's hopefully we get through them. Bruce, let's say I'm using a Merv thirteen filter. Would you also recommend the continuous use of UV UVC treatment of the filter to extend its usable life? 
So UVC is only going to break down the cell wall of organisms. Um, but remember, UVC is not, so for people who don't know, UVC is ultraviolet light C type. Um, it's not going to lessen the number of particles. UVC is going to lessen the number of viable particles. Um, so just keep that in mind. But UVC does work really well on viruses as well because it breaks down the outer envelope of viruses. Okay, Liz Lee, we are currently using UV lights to control the yeast and mold in the room and want to validate the operation of the UV. Where can we purchase the air sampler? So you need to do two things, actually. You need to, uh, oh, man, I don't remember the name of it. Um, uh, it's a UV radiometer. Uh, so you need to be testing the wavelength that is being produced by your UV light. You need to be using the correct type of UV light. So you need to be using UVC. UVA and B is not going to work. Um, and to validate the operation of your UV light in terms of viable particles, as I just told you, UV light's not going to do anything to non-viable particles. It's just going to create more because it's going to blow apart the organisms. Um, but it will destroy viable ones and viruses. Um, you need to do a viable air sampling test to make sure that the UVC is working. So typically with a handheld uh, air sampler, we stick it in our biosafety cabinet that has been UVC'd. Uh, and we just confirm that in fact, there is no organisms and you can do surface tests as well. Okay. Um, and where can we purchase the air sampler? Is that, did you answer? Hey, that? you can call me. There you go. <laughs> I'll put Maria's uh, contact details in the follow-up email. Okay, how about that? Uh, Marugan, is there any correlation between the higher air particulate matter versus the microbial load? Yeah, and so that's what I talked about a little bit earlier. Um, when you take a particle count result, let's say you have a particle count of 100 on January 1st, and then monsoon season hits You know, a few months later, uh, and your particle count goes up to 300. But you haven't done viable or non-viable. All you know is that there is an increase of particulate matter. So what you need to ask is, I need a particle count with a viable particle count in January. And then after, let's say, monsoon season, high humidity, you do a particle count with another viable particle count. And then you see the increase is actually in viable organisms. That's going to tell you one thing. If you see no increase in viable organism, but an increase in non-viable counts, then that tells you something else. Maybe you have um, more dust or whatever being kicked around. So you need both to answer that question. Okay, okay. Um, oh, oh, we. Would you recommend that airborne food and surface microbe test sampling point and time be near each other so that the results are correlated with each other? Absolutely. Is it required? No. But does it make for better science? Yes. Does it make for a better story? Yes. Does it make for a more accurate depiction of the snapshot in your area? Absolutely. Is it required? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Okay, great. Uh, Pre-drag, pre you mentioned dry plate. How much of a difference does it make if sampling has been done on a hydrated plate or a dry plate? Um, a lot of these dry plates have validated. Um, a lot of these dry plates are validated. And so it doesn't make much of a difference at all, actually. Now, it does make a difference, the amount of transportation time, because I'm telling you water activity content matters to the viability of bacteria, yeast, and mold. So you need to be mindful of that. But all of that is a part of the COAs of both uh, hydrated plates and non-hydrated plates. Okay. And Jerry, what are reasonable limits for yeast and molds in air plates, cell plates, in a food packaging manufacturing environment? paper, folding board, etc. Many thanks. Yeah. 
I, I wish I could answer that, but that's based on a risk assessment again. If I had my way, there would be no, no bacteria, yeast, or mold in my food unless I say that it should be there, but, um, or it's in beer. Yeah. But pretty much um, that is going to have to be based on your risk assessment. No one should tell you that, but your quality department and the specification that you uphold. Okay. And we, would it be acceptable to only test broad spectrum on routine, then when results is out of norm, then we test for differential selective? Yeah, absolutely. You can actually have your lab um, do broad spectrum. So if you send your plates to us, we'll do broad spectrum. And then let's say we give you a report that's you know, 100 CFUs per cubic meter, and you say, all right, my indicator organism is E. coli. I just need to make sure that none of these 100 CFUs are E. coli. What we can do is take a subsample of your plate um, or transfer some of that plate to um, liquid broth, put it on a chromogenic plate. We can also transfer pure colonies to chromogenic or differential plates. So all that can be done. Yep, okay. it's then- perfectly fine. And another question from we do you you mentioned humidity just now is humidity monitoring prerequisite for airborne microbe monitoring to be meaningful um honestly in my opinion yes but a lot of these standards are very strict there's particle requirements humidity requirements water activity requirements um so if you're going to do viable particulates, I would say definitely monitor the humidity of your test. Okay, and another one from we lots of questions. Do you have a risk assessment guidance document specifically for airborne microbial monitoring in food factory? Does ISO 14644 cover that? So ISO 14644 covers the purity classes for um, air. But I think there's also a a risk assessment guidance document that we have at our website. So if you want to give us a call, somebody can definitely talk you through that. And I think we've reached the top, finally. Uh, I I skipped past lots of comments, by the way, that was saying great presentation. Thank you. And it was. Uh, Shiva is just mentioning there. He's interested in internships, this sector, research projects. Have you got any advice for somebody new in, into this area, Maria? <laughs> Have fun. <laughs> uh, don't freak out. That's the biggest thing that I tell people who come into microbiology. Um, once you realize that it's everywhere and that you're still alive, it's okay. Don't freak out. Um, definitely, if you're into microbiology, try to get um, try to get into Uh, internships in high school or try to get into internships at your local university or college. A lot of those guys are looking for free help. If you are in university and college and trying to transition to a career in microbiology, try to get into a a startup or try to get into a third-party lab. A lot of the times those third-party labs are um, uh, like um, diagnostic But if you can get into like a hospital testing lab, uh, something ran by the state, uh, things like that, those are all really great options. But if you're just an at-home tinkerer, man, if you want to go to your local brewery place that manufactures beers or wines, or if you just want to go outside and mix up some dirt and then buy some cheap auger plates and just see what grows, you totally can. Uh, Just don't lick the plate. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> brilliant oh that's superb maria it's the last food safety friday of the year it's been the longest one but i must say probably the most informative one absolutely great presentation and the questions amazing and and you're an absolute star so uh thank you very much maria um I'm, hopefully next year you'll be doing some more with us yeah yeah hope so why not Okay. All right. Just lots of great comments in the sidebar. I'll put your contact details in the follow-up email, Maria. Great. So expect to be called in due course. <laughs> Thank you, guys. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Maria. Bye. Bye. Okay. Uh, that was great. Really enjoyed that.
one and a half hours over time. <laughs> she did great, didn't she, Maria? Maria Sandoval from Trace Analytics. Um, and uh, Trace Analytics are a sponsor of IFSQM. So thanks very much, everybody. That's it now until the new year. Um, we'll be putting our program out early in the new year. So every month we'll have Food Safety Fridays. Um, I've put the certificate in the sidebar. Please add your own name to it. I will be following up with the recording, the slides and the certificate and Maria's contact details in the follow-up email. So take care, everybody. Um, have a happy Friday. Enjoy your weekend and we'll see you in a few weeks. Okay, bye.